<laughs> What's going on? It's uh, Quentin, Idiot Reads and Rambles, coming back into house uh, to just do a random ramble on Richard Brodigan's stuff. Because I've been reading um, for March the Mammoth, The Anatomy of Melancholy wasn't working out, and I decided to start reading uh, Jubilee Hitchhiker instead. And this, I've been, in, it's just the right time for me reading this, and I feel uh, that it was a really good change for, for me, for, for March of the Mammoth, you know? Um, this has been a really fun sort of dive into Richard Brodigan's life. Now, it has me going just about every which way in terms of looking for stuff to read. I mean, it's kind of sold me on his poetry, again, because of the way that it talked about uh, Brodigan's willingness to bend forms in books like... Um, Books like the Edna Webster of a uh, collection of undiscovered writings, which was a collection of um, juvenilia that they that his uh, his neighbor Edna Webster had stuck tucked away in her house. Uh, he was sending her daughter all types of love poetry, and she was not passing it on to her daughter. And that's what we got. And we in here we have a bunch of interesting uh, things going on. We have experimental dramas where uh, you know there there are plays written prose. Uh, we have a novel, a really interesting novel called um, I Watched the World Go Effortlessly By, which is about Brodigan's time in an asylum. He is a sort of, it's a kind of a, uh, thinly veiled autofiction, but it's also very poetic. I should actually just read some of it. Um, yeah, whatever, I'll read some of it. I mean, I don't know, this is going to be a long video. Probably I'm just going to ramble. No, really aimless stuff. Um, the head note is, we were all little children. And this is basically the novel. Um, it's in every chapter is less than a um, one thing. It's kind of a hackneyed uh, kind of uh, form-breaking take, I think. But it winds up being like a 500-word poem, where if you, if you treat the chapters as line breaks, uh, it's quite an interesting poem, I think. Book One. Once upon a time, I was a little boy in love with a brown teddy bear. Then I was 18 years old, and I was sitting in a room in the Lane, Country, Lane County Courthouse. There were some men in the room. The men told me that they were committing me to the state insane asylum. Then I was standing outside the room. I remember my mother coming, dreamlike, towards me, and she was crying. Her lips formed the word Tommy, but no sound came from them, except crying. My father said, everything is going to be okay. Yes, I said. They're sending me away to the madhouse. Everything is going to be all right. You bet. Book two. and I was in the front seat of a car. A guard was sitting beside me. The car left my hometown, Eugene, Oregon, and started towards Salem, where the state insane, insane asylum is located. It was raining. The rain came gently from a gray winter sky. Jesus Christ was sitting in the back seat. He had on a pair of handcuffs. A guard was sitting beside him. God, why did you take our mother away? Jesus Christ said. God, why did you take our mother away? Jesus Christ said. Jesus Christ had a face mild as a lamb's. He moved him and his handcuffs jingled. He did not move again for a long time. He did not say anything again for a long time. I stared out the window. It's raining, said the guard in the back seat. Yeah, said the guard in the front seat. They had guard-like voices. The windshield wiper went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. God, not our mother, yelled Jesus Christ. Not our mother. Shut that up, said the guard in the back seat. Jesus Christ did not say anything else for a long time, and neither did the guards. I listened to the windshield wiper and stared out the window and thought about the girl whom I loved. I could see her face, hear her voice. I could imagine what she thought about me being taken away to the state insane asylum. I tried very hard not to cry. I stared out the window. 
I saw a little boy sitting on the front porch of an old house. The little boy was holding a white cat in his arms. I tried very hard not to cry. I stared out the window and watched the world glide effortlessly by. BYE. Really interesting little tiny uh, piece in there, I thought. And this has been a really interesting sort of read for me because Richard Brodigan's voice is very close to fully formed, far closer to fully formed than I believed it would be when I read this, when they picked this up. Um, really uh, some great love poetry in here. Um, his poetic sensibilities, the gentleness, the pithiness, the, the short, the, the terseness, and the uh, metaphors are all in this. Um, so I would definitely recommend this. Um, and I've been reading about that in uh, this thing, uh, The Jubilee Hitchhiker, uh, uh, Life of and Times of Richard Brodigan by William Tornsberg. Pretty good stuff. I would definitely say that. Uh, another thing that's been interesting to read in here is uh, just when Richard Brodigan moves to Frisco, San Francisco, and starts talking to the Beats, he, Allen Ginsberg calls him like a, like a, something like a, a pathetic neurotic or something like that, which is kind of, maybe I don't know uh, Ginsberg's biography, um, too well, it's kind of the pod calling the kettle black, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, but around the time of the uh, the Howell uh, obscenity trial, uh, Richard Brodigan is meeting there with so many people and he is uh, getting advice on his poems and he's publishing. Um, the people at Inferno Press uh, want to uh, do him a solid and publish this tiny little booklet called The Return of the Rivers. Publish 100 copies so Brodigan can sell it and basically feel like a poet. And uh, at the time of writing uh, that, they went for... 7,500 bucks. Um, that, that book went for 7,500 bucks on the uh, rare book market. Interesting, that sort of like irony. Um, but that sort of talk about Richard Broughton's poetry, I'd be wanting to give it another shot, you know? So what I did was I grabbed um, Loading Mercury, the pitchfork first. And this has been an interesting read. I mean, with Broughton's poetry, uh, one thing you really have to know is that this is a late era poetry collection and in his poetry particularly he doesn't view it as a very technical thing not at all i mean the the the, uh, the assembly of a collection is organized in a very um loose but interesting way in kind of a similar way as trout fishing in america they seem episodic they seem uh the events in this book seem episodic it seems very um disconnected, uh, disconnected from reality, but really this book is a gigantic, gigantic ode to creativity, and it's a sort of ode to um, uh, the ideal American life and the, the American sort of uh, creative intellect at the time um, that is obviously in conflict with uh, pop culture at the time. But um, in this book, sort of brought again, he, Writing is like a playground to him. It's not a very technical thing. There's a symbolic logic that dominates this book, and that symbolic logic is to the fore in uh, his poetry collections, namely this one, uh, Loading Mercury, The Pitchfork. And his poems, again, it's, it's not, don't expect massive um, statements about, you know, the nature of everything, uh, the nature of life, all that stuff, but it's just very well done sort of minimalist poetry here i think especially uh, there's that symbolic logic that organizes a great deal there are these sections i particularly like the autobiography poems where uh, you'll have richard brodigan the first part of this he'll in these autobiography poems he'll have a line and then there'll be a random open parentheses and he will never close the parentheses uh, open parenthesis i should say he doesn't close them and i think it's a really interesting sort of way to talk about um, the way that like he opens them, he doesn't close them, and everything else in the collection falls into that parenthesis. Uh, really interesting way to like frame and organize a collection. Um, that's obviously not talking about the way the poems are actually sequenced uh, that much, but you get little little gems like this. This is uh, autobiography too. Uh, when the moon shines like a dead garage. Again, you already have Brodigan sort of compelling. Um, uh, uh, his, his eye for metaphor. You can't teach that eye for metaphor. When the moon shines like a dead garage, I travel with gasoline ghosts down all those haunted miles of the past, 27 Model A miles an hour in 1939, going to where I had forgotten. 
I'll read that again. When the moon shines like a dead garage, I travel with gasoline ghosts down all those haunted miles of the past, 27 Model A miles an hour in 1939, going to where I have forgotten. Um, which is quite nice, the way that he has all of these kind of, um, you know, uh, the way he's braiding the, the, the moon, uh, all, all these sort of uh, objects, literal and figurative, uh, he's braiding them all together, he's mixing all his metaphors into one thing, the moon, the uh, garage, cars, that that those types of metaphors, and all of that is uh, combining with the ghosts metaphors to create what I think is a really interesting uh, poem. And one thing I really appreciate about Rodigan is that he, for as much as he is a postmodern writer through and through, assuming postmodernity is a thing, um, he is that. But uh, in this collection and late in his career, you get the, the Japanese aesthetics start really governing his poems. And that is a particularly beautiful thing, I think, in his late uh, works like An Unfortunate Woman, and particularly So the Wind Won't Blow It All Away, the sort of vibrant colors and vibrant experimentation of in watermelon sugar and trout fishing in America falls away from more subtle, more minimalistic stuff, although his minimalism is there from the beginning. Um, more There are more shadows in late Richard Brodigan, actually, and uh, An Unfortunate Woman is a straight-up eye novel uh, in the Japanese tradition, I think. He also dedicates Sombrero Follow to Junichiro Tanizaki, and I think it's really interesting that his capacity for indirectness sort of comes uh, alongside that influence of, of people like John Barth and uh, Thomas Pynchon. It, actually, those those people don't influence him, but that sort of uh, metaphysic or not metaphysical, metafictional quality of those authors is totally there in Brodigan, you know? Um, and I think it's really interesting that he goes the opposite route. He pairs it down and you get in, Wid in Willard and his Bowling Trophies, another great Brodigan novel. Um, with some of his best writing, I think. I can't seem to find it right now. Um, in that book, particularly, uh, you get a lot of postmodern uh, meta metafictional games, like, you know, the who's calling the Logan brothers. Like, it's Brodigan. Um, uh, who is, uh, you know, who's doing all these things? Who's organizing all this? What What is the author's role in all this? And on top of that, you have the very uh, bare, stripped-down um, sort of Monono Aware type of story of Bob and Constance, which is just uh, some of his best writing and and just such a, a deeply sad <laughs> narrative. But again, that's, I, that's a, I'm sort of rambling here, but that's what I really appreciate about Brodigan, the collision of those influences. Um, you also have incredible poems in here, uh, that poems that exemplify that type of, um, the, that type of uh, minimalism colliding with like humor and whimsy and it's all emotive which is one thing I very much appreciate about Brodigan's poetry and that I've been picking up that he's learning from all types of other authors in Jubilee Hitchhiker there's a lot about his influences too in here and he's trying to give these tiny poems these minimalistic poems a distinct sense of emotion and there's a great one in here that I'm trying to find, but I'm, I'm failing, quite honestly, uh, called Attila at the Gates of the Telephone Company, which uh, it's really ridiculous, but it's it's a very sort of, I don't know, it, it's a very apt sort of display of emotion, you know, but it's done in a in a sort of haiku type of way. He loved Basho. Um, it's no wonder uh, he lived in, um, in uh, Tokyo for so long. Um, this is the poem I've just found it. Attila at the gates of the telephone company. They said that my telephone would be fixed by six. They guaranteed it. <laughs> I think that's a charming poem, you know, the, the sense of emotion there, I think, is, is tangible. Um, and also, it's hilarious, Attila at the gates of the telephone company, you know, this one place that you can never take. Uh... I think it's great. There's a really, I love the, the whimsy in Brodigan that collides with that kind of uh, just indirect, detached sadness, you know? Uh, they guaranteed it. Just not saying anything directly, but that, that emotion to that is, is there, and it's quite compelling to me. Um, so that's been really nice. I've been reading, uh, rereading uh, many passages of Brodigan. I've also collected, I've taken the uh, collections uh, Rommel, 
Uh, Rommel drives on deep into Egypt, uh, which has been good thus far. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, June 30th, June 30th, which is his final poetry collection, and I've been enjoying. Um, what I've read of this has been extremely indirect, like way, like he's not been that indirect in his entire career up until An Unfortunate Woman, which is uh, hauntingly indirect, disturbingly indirect, uh, in some ways dementedly indirect almost, uh, although demented is not a word that you would really associate with Brodigan. Um, so yeah, it's been really nice, and I've been, that's been kind of putting me on to all these other writers that um, I've been reading uh, who are minimalistic, right? I've been reading, um, what the hell? Obviously, um, Stephen Crane, his complete poems, um, really interesting stuff. Uh, not incredible poetry, I think, but just really, really uh, violent poetry, violent, violent, violent poetry. Um, there's a good, uh, bit of poems in here called War is Kind, a good collection. Um, trying to walk, or not walk, I'm trying to look for uh, one specifically. But I, I feel a very sort of uh, similar sort of uh, thing between Crane and Brodigan in that uh, just giving tiny, tiny things, compressing uh, uh, compressing the hell out of one reflection and giving it a really strong sense of emotion, perhaps indirect, like this one. This is not from War's Kind. In the desert, I saw a creature, naked, bestial, who, squatting upon the ground, held his heart in his hands and ate of it. I said, is it good, friend? It is bitter, bitter, he answered, but I like it because it is bitter and because it is my heart. You know, I, I think that's that's a very compelling poem. And, you know, there's something that is, like, undeniable about uh, about that, you know? Just the, that indirect of, that indirect sense and that, that reflection that is so emotive. Um, 78. Um, here's another good one. This is from War of Kind. War is Kind, sorry. To the maiden, the sea was blue meadow, alive with little froth people singing. To the sailor, wrecked, the sea was dead gray walls, superlative and vacancy, upon which, nevertheless, at fateful time, was written the grim hatred of nature. The brutal poetry right here, you know. Um, I think I've left this. I've left another thing in my bag, but no, I have not. Um... Sorry for not being prepared here. I'm uh, doing this in the, the dark because, you know, it's been weird. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll talk about uh, the sort of Richard Brodigan, um, some interesting random, I suppose this is gonna be a Brodigan video. Um, I'll talk about some random other things. What I've been getting from the library too is I've gotten his poetry collections and I've gotten some scholarship on him. There's a nice book uh, called uh, Richard Brodigan and Annotated Bibliography. If you'd like to get into some of the scholarship, get that from a library. Um, it's uh, quite good. And this piece of scholarship right here um, came out, it was written before So the Wind Won't Blow It All Away and, and An Unfortunate Woman. So you won't get analyses of those in these pages, but what you do get is basically everything leading up to that, um, barring uh, Edna Webster and the Juvenalia. Um, all his major novels are in here, except for that one, um, this short story collections, Revenge of the Lawn. I consider Tokyo Montana Express a short story collection, even if Brodigan doesn't. And yeah, there's discussions of basically everything, and this thing has been quite illuminating, uh, for me, at least for his collection, um, uh, uh, no, his, uh, his story, uh, Confederate General from Big Sur, that's kind of a... It talks about it as if it's like an experiment in um, narrative strategy, almost. So, really interesting read here. Real short read. I recommend it if you just want to get a scholarly perspective on Richard Brodigan. Um, pretty accessible, too, I thought. And another one of my favorite stories, and perhaps not one of my favorite, actually. Just a kind of sad story about Richard Brodigan. Um, Stephen Moore, unfortunately, figures in this story because he was working... Uh, there's an... I read on uh, JSTOR or something like that. I think it's in this book here. Um, 
essays on the writings and life of uh, Richard Brodigan, edited by John F. Barber. Now, this is a really interesting little work. It is a collection of essays. I haven't read all of them, but uh, William Hjortsberg is in here, of course. Um, Stephen Moore has something called Paper Flowers, Richard Brodigan's Poetry, which he basically had, uh, after Richard Brodigan died, he was, this is my favorite anecdote about, uh, about uh, his publishing his poetry, his, probably, his poetry probably. Uh, when Richard Brodigan died, Stephen Moore was waiting for the collected poems to come out, the complete poems of Richard Brodigan, and that never happened. So what he did was basically went and, I guess, uh, he a company, uh, a publisher wanted him to help out, so he went and tried to publish them. He got uh, the rights, uh, I, I believe he got basically everything in order and the Brodigan estate has basically uh, okayed everything, but the publisher, I believe, went belly up and nothing round wound up happening with that, you know? It just, it sucks to think that we were that close to getting the complete poems of Richard Brodigan, but it fell through, you know? Very sad, I think. Uh, he deserves his uh, poems to be, um, he deserves to be published in the complete, published in the complete poems. Um, so, yeah, but this has a uh, sort of essays on just about anything. Uh, if you want a, a Dreaming of Babylon uh, essay, there's just random sort of essays about people remembering him. There is a whole lot in here that you might be of interest to. Uh, you might be of interest in. You might be interested. That might be of interest, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I really, um, would suggest this just if you want to get random um not really a sustained scholarly focus like uh this one although sustained for for how many pages right but um just random sort of essays i might direct you here um you know all right and what else can i really talk about uh, willard has been great i've enjoyed willard and uh, my girlfriend has enjoyed that too surprisingly um not a lot of people really, um, I don't know, I, I, I always forget that Brodigan is as accessible as he is. <laughs> Sorry. You know, this is what I'm using for light. <laughs> I got this in the bookshelf. And check out the blossoms. Check out the blossoms over there. How good are those blossoms? Um, okay. Where on earth is that last anthology? Well, oh no, it's down here. Why the hell is it under my bed? God damn it. So, Lighting, get back there. Yeah, that kind of intimate lighting, right? Now, one thing that uh, I've been realizing I've uh, gotten from Brodigan's poetry that I really uh, enjoy is the Imagists, actually. And I went to a little awesome thing. I was, uh, I met up with one of my profs to discuss one of my essays in the works. Um, and, you know, I was having a bit of a tough time and there was something going on for um, upper year students at... Um, the university, it was a little pizza party thing. They were giving away free books and they were giving pizzas. So uh, the prof brought me up there and uh, I was an honorary uh, fourth year for the one day. And I scored a free book, um, um, Elements of Literature, Fiction, Poetry, Drama. There's some, there's some drama in here. There's uh, Sophocles and um, obviously, you know, Shakespeare's King Lear, you know, stuff like that. Um, Pygmalion. Um, Beckett, Miller, uh, Oscar Wilde, those types of people. Um, there is uh, short stories in here from, you know, all the, the big ones that you'd really expect, post Hawthorne. Um, then there's a great deal of poetry in here that I thought was really, uh, really interesting. I can't believe that nobody uh, grabbed this up, but apparently, you know, people are comfortable just reading um, complete crap. <laughs> uh, I mean, what's new, right? But you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. You know, there's uh, stuff from uh, Michael Ondatier, uh, from, uh, I believe he's Canadian and Indigenous author. There is stuff from uh, Dion Brand, Dion Brand, um, who, uh, you know, I'm reading from for another course. There's stuff from, you know, all the sort of big names. Uh, it's nice to have a volume here that I didn't pay anything for and that I could just kind of, you know, you know have around, right? Um, and then... Somehow, uh, oh yeah, yeah, this is supposed to relate to my Imagist Poetry Anthology, and that's supposed to relate to Richard Brodigan. I don't know how. So, yeah, at the, I went there, and I wound up, uh, my girlfriend was there, and uh, I wound, she wound up stealing an Imagist Poetry Anthology, and um, the Imagist Poetry has inspired me a great deal, and I was actually thinking of sending to uh, my hometown so that they could send up my uh, copy of 
my images poems because I find them quite inspiring. They're not always great, but I find them very inspiring. That uh, type of condensing things has been on my mind a lot with Brodigan, his poetry, and with Crane, and I've been returning to, you know, so, uh, some other poets that I have and reading those sonnet sequences, which those aren't actually that condensed, but you know, the reading shorter poetry and has really has me really excited to get back into haiku and and images poetry seem like a natural fit, you know. Um, there's a lot of great stuff in this thing, you know. I, I do really enjoy Images poetry. There's a couple great little short stories in here, actually, that I think are are really, they work well as Images poetry. Um, I think you should totally read some of these, uh, specifically, uh, just, um, obviously, you know, Pound's Images poetry is kind of essential for understanding uh, the movement. Uh, John Gold Fletcher has a poem called Irradiations in Ten Parts that is just freaking stunning. Um, the language there is just way too good. HD's poems are, are very interesting if you can kind of climb around in them for long enough. And, you know, they're not individually, I don't think they work that well. But as a group, HD's poetry is in, in collection form is really good. Uh, really uh, interesting sort of like thematic nooks and crannies in the her style of, of her just her I don't want to say her prose style, but the, the images she selects and the way she describes them is kind of hypnotic in a really interesting way. Um, yeah, I I really enjoy uh, those. I really enjoy um, T. E. Hume Holm Holme uh, Hume. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he's got some really interesting ones. Uh, specifically, Autumn. These are like proto images poetry where, you know, you think about image as poetry and what it really is when you get down to business is uh, you're taking sort of the vehicle and the tenor of a metaphor and you're basically collapsing them into one so that you can't really, it's tough to distinguish. You know what I mean? Um, and I've written stuff like that as well in that vein. Uh, actually, uh, when I was writing all in all these different forms, one thing I did was I went to my Norton Anthology and I took the um, image as poetry uh, manifesto at the pound and I, I wrote a couple poems in that exact style if you want actually just message me i'll send you the the uh, results of it it is very it is varying levels of, of success but i think that in focusing on the right things is really interesting and it can lead to some really good results and one of the results one of the emotive results i'll share is evening by richard brodigan uh richard aldington too many richards man get the richards out of the video evening the chimneys, rank on rank, cut the clear sky. The moon, with a rag of gauze about her loins, poses among them, an awkward Venus. And here am I, looking wantonly at her, over the kitchen sink. I'll read it again. The chimneys, rank on rank, cut the clear sky. The moon, with a rag of gauze about her loins, poses among them, an awkward Venus. And here am I looking wantonly at her over the kitchen sink. No direct statement in that, but I very much appreciate the sort of poetic sensibility of it, and I think it's his best uh, images poem. Um, yeah. Autumn by T.E. Hulme. 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 <laughs> A touch of cold in the autumn night. I walked abroad and saw the ruddy moon lean over a hedge like a red-faced farmer. I did not stop to speak, but nodded, and round about were the wistful stars with white faces like town children. You know, there's something... I, some of this stuff just doesn't... It's, it doesn't cut that deep, but uh, the way that they describe these these images just really gets to me in a certain way that I that I found unique to images poetry, actually. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can find the short story that I found just tonight. Um, it's, a, my, it's a mini piece of flash fiction that actually works as an images poem by John Cornos called The Rose, and I have found it, and I'll just uh, read it. It's less than a page. I remember a day when I stood on the seashore at Nice, holding a scarlet rose in my hands. The calm sea, caressed by the sun, was brightly garmented in blue, veiled in gold and violet, verging on silver. 
Gently the waves lapped the shore, and scattering into pearls, emeralds, and emeralds and opals, hastened towards my feet with a monotonous, rhythmical sound, like the prolonged note of a single harp string. High in the clear, blue, golden sky hung the great, burning disk of the sun. White seagulls hovered above the waves, now barely touching them with their snow-white breasts, now rising anew into the heights, like butterflies over the green meadows. Far in the east, a ship trailing its smoke glided slowly from sight, as though it had foundered in the waste. I threw the rose into the sea and watched it, caught in the wave, receding, red on the snow-white foam, paler on the emerald wave. And the sea continued to return it to me, again and again, at last no longer a flower, but strewn petals on restless water. So with the heart, and with all proud things. In the end, nothing remains but a handful of petals of what was once a proud flower. I just find that is an, a, a frankly perfectly executed um, imagist poem. I, I really love that, you know? But that's about it. I'll uh, cut it here. I've rambled too long as is. But that's kind of what's been going on with me. You know, I've been getting really into Richard Brodigan stuff, and I can't wait for the semester to end, because then I'll be sort of free to read what I want for a little bit, and i, I got to catch up on that reading, you know? I've been very happy with how much the Mammoth is going, just checking in, um, taking it at a very leisurely pace, my uh, Jubilee Hitchhiker, Richard Brodigan. Very interesting stuff, and um, I suppose I'll leave you with a two-paragraph passage that I really enjoyed about uh, a rent party that Richard Brodigan orchestrated, and it kind of characterizes, uh, his humor is perfect. Richard Brodigan has met his wife, uh, Ginny, and what they have been doing is, uh, Ginny's been um, basically helping him out as a poet. She really believes in his poetic abilities, and he's trying to get published and make a career out of this, and she is uh, working and basically paying the bills. Wanting to do his share, Brodigan came up with an amusing contribution to the family's monthly expense needs. He organized a rent party. Such affairs have been commonplace in New York's Harlem and Greenwich Village during the 20s when a hot piano player and a bathtub full of rot gut booze provided the come on. Richard had no live entertainment to offer and invented an ingenious promotional device. He posted handbills all over North Beach advertising the event as a fundraiser to buy the, the host a gorilla suit. Ken Davis remembered Richard Brodigan's party, uh, sorry, Ken Davis remembered Brodigan's rent party on Washington Street with, such, with much amusement. And we actually had total strangers, total strangers, like tourists wandered in and said, where's that guy that wants to buy the gorilla suit? And here are these guys from like Tuscaloosa or Tampa or San Jose. And Dick said, well, I've always wanted to wear a gorilla suit. Don't you think I'd look good in a gorilla suit? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a really funny passage. And um, I say get this book. It's delightful on just about every page. It can be a lot, but it's, um, you know, it, it's very, very delightful. It's uh, if you're interested in Brodigan or not, it's just a really interesting uh, story. It's told like a one big story. But it's very clear Hjornsberg has researched this extensively. Um, there are great passages about Brodigan's mental uh, ho hospital stay and specifically how he's telling his mother what's going on at the, the mental hospital. And he's telling her that he had to help uh, basically um, hold patients who were getting electro electroshock therapy down. Um, electro electroshock therapy is uh, was designed to... Um, uh, uh, it was designed to uh, create a mini seizure in your brain that was supposed to help rearrange your um, your your mind like that. And he would he was telling his mom he would help hold patients down and he'd help them bite on stuff when it was happening. But it's very clear that he that, that was his way of telling his mom that um, obviously, first of all, obviously another patient wouldn't be allowed to do that to another patient uh, under any circumstances. But he's kind of trying to tell his mom, like, this is what I went through. What I'm telling you is my what I went through. He'd tell his mom about the way they drooled all over him and the way they kicked and screamed. And you could tell him that he's just being, he's just very indirectly telling his mom what he went through. And it's very touching uh, to hear that, you know. 
and then one of his friends uh, has the same thing done in Prisco, and everyone's busting his balls, uh, or everyone's talking about like, wow, he's such a freaking, he's so ridiculous now, this guy, I can't believe he like, like he's, he's like this now, and Richard was always uh, sympathetic to him. I just, you know, uh, I, just, I just very much relate to Richard Brodigan, specifically that sort of playground attitude towards his poetry, and I just, I'm very, um, I've been very happy to read more about him, but 35 minutes, that's about it. I'll uh, I'll go. I might do more of these just rambly videos where I just talk about uh, random stuff for 35 minutes. So, yeah, um, it's been tough as of late at school. I'm not going to lie. I've, uh, it's been very frustrating to realize that intelligence um, doesn't necessarily get you far in academia. <laughs> um, all it really requires is uh, a, few, a few of your skills to be really good, and uh, that's been a bit of a struggle for me, especially, you know, um, I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> uh, my essay skills are getting better, but um, yeah, it's been, it's been tough, and I'm just, I'm tired, you know, I'm so tired, <laughs> but I've been, uh, I've been pushing on, so yeah. Peace and groovy.